Okay. So, um, so it's recording now. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. So this is a, a let's play of Kentucky Route Zero. I'm sitting here uh, with one of the uh, game creators, and Jake Elliott, and uh, we're in his north side Chicago apartment. And he's been uh, good enough to uh, have a little conversation with me as we as we play his uh, his dreamy game, <laughs> Kentucky Route Zero. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the soundscape and the, um, and the, uh, and, and the gradual pan down, um, I guess I, I'm interested in knowing, um, uh, with you and, uh, Tamas, Tamas? Tamas, yeah. 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 What, um, uh, yeah, um, like if you talk about who did what and how you, you know, sort of like... Like uh, I, I, I don't know if it's anywhere on the on the website as far mm -hmm. as like, you know, um, is that something you you guys uh, sort of talk about that kind of thing? Like yeah, well, kind of. I mean, we, you know, we usually talk about it as just being like deeply collaborative. Uh huh. And um, uh, you know, I think for us, part of where we're coming from is like from artists always working in collaboration, you know, and, and so sometimes like talking about the different roles can be kind of like weirdly sort of um, weirdly interfere with this sort of more like collaboration narrative that we want right, to tell that right. but, um, but yeah like you know it's like there's some pretty simple answers which is like Tomas does all the art um, and I do all the writing and then we both kind of do programming mm -hmm. on it um, and like you know stuff like the structure of this scene you know yeah, Tomas is also mostly kind of responsible for um, imagining how things will be shaped you know how the spaces fit together and how mm -hmm. they work and what, what it's like to move through them and stuff like that where things go <laughs> right right yeah. and yeah. as far as the cinematography and that yeah, kind of yeah, thing. yeah 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 and that's that's cool you know with Tomas he's like a really um, really talented programmer in addition to being an artist so um, he's he's doing a lot of like there's a lot of code involved in like setting up this kind of camera work that he really has a specific idea of the camera work he wants hmm. and so he can build those systems to like enable that when he needs to right <clears throat> That's that's super interesting. The um, I I really uh, found this super charming. The 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 maybe you can talk to a little bit of the that kind of um, horseshoe kind of idea oh, yeah. and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, that was um, yeah, that was uh, something that surprised me also when I saw it. That, you know, it's must. Wow. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> um, it surprised you so much. Yeah, right. it's still sort of a surprise. <laughs> There's like another part of it that's not in the didn't we didn't keep in the game. Uh -huh. That was like another little animation when um, whenever you're walking, like if you hold the button down, this other little cursor follows it around. Hmm. It was like also very whimsical and it's like um, like a weather vane spinning, but it was just like getting to be too much, like stuff moving around all the time. You know? Right. Um, yeah, for me it was just a perfect kind of. Um, a uh, little touch that that um, kind of uh, brings the UI into uh, the story and the mm. mythos of the of the, the sort of uh, yeah. character. But um, yeah. So there's something so. Um, uh, nice about the 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 uh, slightly abstract aspect, the, so the tininess of 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 video game um, characters that allow for people to project oh, yeah. things onto them. Um, I think it, it probably would have started at a at a time where it wasn't possible to kind of have the detail, yeah, uh, because of the limitations of the technology. But at this stage. Obviously, you guys, you guys have made a choice to, to yeah. sort of embrace that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely it was a shift. Like, the first character designs that we had were a lot more detailed. And, right. And, um, and they were really, like, they were modeled after actors that, you know, I mean, not, like, specific actors, but, like, we were looking at some of, like, these, um, 
yeah, actors from like Tennessee Williams stuff, and I think you know, like I don't know, like Marlon Brando or something like that. But they're like these people that kind of have had had this like mid twentieth century look to them. I think. Right, right. Um, I mean, I you know, to most of the characters, and I can't speak for him too much, but that's kind of where I think where we were looking. Um, but then this iteration, the final sort of iteration, yeah, they don't even have faces. Some of them have glasses, but none of them have like facial features. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's pretty pretty different. Yeah, yeah, and like. Um, yeah, I'd be interested in, because I saw the original Kickstarter video mm-hmm. yeah. that has, a, like, a vastly different sort of yeah. aesthetic. And, um, yeah, and I mean, this this one, I guess, um, might, like, uh, I don't know if, if uh, was Sword and Sorcery sort of, like, an influence at all? and Or was that something that you yeah, guys are... Yeah, um, I, you know, I don't remember talking about Sword and Sorcery during that, that moment, but, um... I mean, yeah, that's it. We definitely, it's awesome. <laughs> the, the art direction that one's pretty, pretty striking, pretty remarkable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think you know we we looked, we did explicitly look at um, another world, uh, that um, and like flashback and that stuff from that period. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, in another world, he uh, like designed this sort of um, proto flash thing for it. You were like read about his process it's it's Mm-mm. really wild he, he uh yeah he made like a vector graphics animation engine just for another world so it's like was you know kind of like like i was talking about with tomas was doing all this kind of graphics programming and other programming just to get these effects that he wants it's similarly mm-hmm. the designer of another world it's like built this whole apparatus to create this game and it gave it this very distinct visual style that i don't think we'd seen really before right but we yeah we looked i mean tomas and i had seen it when we looked at when we started working on this we looked at those kind of things, yeah. yeah. yeah That's interesting. Sure. Yeah, from from a perspective of like you know something that comes out of uh, um, that emerges from the sort of um, I guess the the domain of the programming, like uh, you know the either the artifacts or procedurally generated mm-hmm. image imagery and that kind of thing is is yeah super interesting. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I. I um, so so yeah maybe, I mean I, I uh, remember playing this game um, originally and just being like uh, so happy that the writing uh, was had this kind of uh, level of kind of you know obviously a specific flavor but but um, a kind of a, a like a casual subtlety and a, and a mm-hmm. sense of that it's. Um, uh, that it's anachronistic, but mm. not like uh, to the extent where it's like a um, shticky, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. So yeah, I guess I guess I mean when you're when you're de- like designing the writing of it or whatever, or when you're doing the writing for it, um, what um, uh, yeah, what like was it ever like entirely sort of period, and then you sort of moved it out of that or. Did it start as kind of like this place where, um, you know, old rumbly diesel sort of furniture yeah. trucks and, and the internet sort of coexist? Yeah, yeah. It's all. It's always. We always thought of it as a place where a bunch of different kind of time periods are sort of all represented. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And there there are specific time periods actually. Also, like the, there are like um, the Depression era, and then also the seventies, and then also present day. Mm-hmm. Um, and those those three periods are kind of specifically chosen as periods of like economic crisis in the okay. United States. Hmm. Um, so that's um, yeah. So, but it's meant to kind of yeah feel like a like a non time or like a kind of stacked time or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in the text, I think you know there there's something in the writing that sometimes feels anachronistic. I, I mean, I, I'm, you know, looking at, like, the, I do a lot of um, close reading of sp- specific other texts that I'm sort of mining for details and taking notes and, like, stealing phrases from and stuff. <laughs> and that's mostly, like, Southern Gothic stuff, like Flannery O'Connor, and then also, like, um, um, uh, you know, again, like, theater stuff, like... Um, <laughs> uh, Arthur Miller and stuff like that. So that stuff is all, you know, really, it's really easy to read the period and a lot of that, especially in Flannery O'Connor stuff, it really feels like that time. You know? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Have you read The Heart is a Lonely Hunter? Yeah, I love that one. Gorgeous yeah. book. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't, uh... 
Yeah, I couldn't believe I hadn't read it like until recently. I'm like, oh, oh man. Yeah. How did I miss this? How did right. how did my whole schooling has failed? <laughs> you know, if, if if I wasn't exposed to yeah. this book until now, you know. Yeah. She, so that's Carson McCullers, right? It's, it's, yeah. 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 That's yeah. I mean, she, and she was really young, I think, when she wrote that one. Yeah. She's she was in like her early twenties. Yeah. yeah, man. Mm-hmm. It's so um the characters in that one are so sort of um like the there's the guy who's like the alcoholic like socialist guy. Yeah. He's such a great character. Yeah, they're all yeah. they're all so um all the characters uh yeah, they're they're really specific but yeah. also they have the a universal kind of uh you have compassion for them. Yeah. You know, and in, in this yeah, in this way, it would have been so easy to lampoon those uh-huh. types, <laughs> and it's such, it's so tender, and you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's wonderful. So I remember playing an earlier version of this game, mm-hmm. in which this this uh, was a completely different um, puzzle and yeah. solution. Yeah. Um, now, um, uh, yeah, so. If I recall, what happened was it was basically, uh, um, I think you encountered some kind of, some kind of statue, or yeah. uh, and when you turned off the light and turned it on again, there was additional things or missing mm-hmm. things, uh, and things changed just by clicking on and off, which is essentially the same way that this this puzzle is yeah. solved. But maybe yeah, could you talk to what? what what went into um, that change and yeah yeah that, that you know yeah we we went through a few different iterations of what to do in this basement and um, I, re- I really liked that that one that we cut mm-hmm. <laughs> it was really it was really nice and weird and set a weird tone because the, the the main difference for me between this one and that one was that um that one had no like words about it it was just right. this weird thing that you encountered and nobody um, Conway didn't talk about it. Nobody else talked about it. And it was just sort of like left for the player to kind of be like, "What even?" Was yeah, that, you know? yeah. And uh, I, I missed that about it, the sort of silence of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, you know, it was just too hard, basically. Like, you know, it was it was asking kind of a lot. Like, not just to turn off the light once, but to like do it a couple times and then recognize that things were changing. And then like, yeah. And um, some people that we were talking to about it um, also mentioned that this, you know, there's this puzzle that they do to like test for like if you're a super genius or something where it's like they show you a picture and then hide it and then show it again and say what's changed and that's right. like a super hard puzzle to oh, do. Okay. you know it's like a, an example so um so to have that be the first kind of like puzzle in the game was maybe a, a bad placement or... <laughs> yeah i feel like it's it's it is quite uh yeah it has that you know um it is yeah i, I agree with you and as as a like I, as as a person who, like, went through that puzzle and got it, and because I guess I'm a super genius, it's yeah, basically what, you know. <laughs> I, and I think I should bring that up explicitly um, <laughs> while I stroke my beard. Right. But um, but at the same time, like, uh, yeah, as a game designer, the very first kind of thing you really don't want to block somebody to the point of mm-hmm. of like um, of frustration, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah, I, I understand. I mean, to me, um, it's interesting. I mean, the 20-sided die is obviously like a gamer reference as well. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, to me, it's it's like, um, um, uh, I don't know, like, it, it's, way, it's way more obvious, but mm-hmm. maybe there's certain things about it, for instance, the way that, that, for, that redeem it for me, that, that you have this choice of leaving it or keeping it, mm-hmm. and you... you it has no consequence, I'm assuming, but yeah, not, not at this point. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. so it's it's like um, um, to me, it's it's I like that decision. I mean, with with unmanned, there's a lot of a lot of like the more kind of complex repercussions of like uh-huh. whether y- your character. Uh, as a drone pilot is an asshole or if yeah. he's a nice guy yeah. it, it's kind of all that stuff happens in people's heads and there's uh-huh. it, there's very little consequence to yeah. what, what you choose but it's still valid in that there's uh, you're you're kind of presenting interesting decisions to people yeah, yeah. so 
to me this it's like um i like i like to see this uh and almost as a as a way of like uh uh almost as a way of of like the player what, how the player sort of feels in relation to games mm -hmm. if if they if if the player is more of a uh yeah d and d is not for me oh. <laughs> versus uh yeah. yes i i i hold it close to my heart right. or or whatever right. so um you know and and because it is one of these decisions as well like you for people who are literate with games they would assume well i've got to hold on to it i have uh -huh. to hold on to everything right. everything <laughs> is useful at some point uh -huh. and they wouldn't just put it in the game for no reason yeah but i, I like that we're getting to a point where actually it sometimes is for no reason or it's no for no it's no um no sort of applicable puzzle solving reason mm -hmm. so what am i going to do that's the question uh, yeah. On the <laughs> yeah i mean also these gamers down in the basement they mm -hmm. um uh if you try to talk to them for a while they kind of like leak out more and more about the game that they're playing and it's like a pretty weird game you know? uh -huh. so it's also sort of setting some player expectations or like maybe kind of indicating to players like you know oh, there's a lot of different kinds of ways that consequences can function or that choices can function and, you know sort of um yeah and also you know i mean those characters we sometimes talk about them as being like a like a chorus and like a greek player and elizabethan play and you know so their role is to kind of tell the audience what they should be thinking you know right right <laughs> so, so that conversation they're having is like I'm not sure this game is winnable. I'm not sure, you know, they're talking about it. Mm -hmm. This is pretty literal in that way. But yeah. 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 That's neat. Um, so, yeah, gorgeous uh, giant horse head. Is this, is this taken from a historical kind of image? Yeah, I don't know, actually. Uh, it's something, yeah, it's a must I, I don't know. It's, I mean, it, it has a kind of... Uh, I have a memory of something like that, yeah, like okay. uh, not seeing it, but maybe seeing it in an archival photo, yeah. or that kind of thing. Owen Data, yeah, he, I mean, he works from reference images a lot, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. memory you know So you know you're tricking gamers into writing poetry, right? <laughs> or at least like um, the equivalent of like a fridge magnet kind of rearrangement. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, or cut up poetry. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Something recombinant. Uh, but it's good, and that's like that's the uh, I guess that's the uh, the sad kind of. Um, uh, reality of a lot of um, a lot of overt writing and writing that uh, attempts to be literary uh, in, in in the gaming world is that um, it's it's really overwrought mm. sort of like it gets attention because it's it does sound like the novels that uh, yeah. people have read in their high school and they had to uh -huh. and people I feel like often I feel like often um, something that is ter can be a terribly written sort of literary pastiche 
yeah. um, serves the purpose for the gaming community of seeing, see, look, we can be literary too, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so for me, I've seen a couple of instances of like, ah, oh, that's just terrible, like uh, high school sort of writing. So yeah. it's wonderful for me to see something that's <laughs> that's really good, uh, you know. Yeah. So. Um, Yeah, I can, I can imagine, I mean, I can imagine that sort of with this anxiety about legitimacy or this anxiety about kitsch or something, you know, mm -hmm. that, that it's like enough to, it's enough in some cases for a player to have something that like, it sounds like it's taking itself seriously, even if it's taking itself a little too seriously. It's yes, like, yes. Yeah. yeah, and that's the nice balance between that the you struck because with the writing, because it has this, um, uh, it's not the secret of Monkey Island. It's not, you know, in the sense of like, it's not going for the kind of um, those types of one-liner kind of humor, which are, which are like, I'm, I'm a big fan, especially of Grim Fandango, uh -huh. the humor and stuff in that. But, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's not going too far in the other direction where you, you do get this painful earnestness. Um, I haven't read these uh, messages. Oh, the emails? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dirty power plus plan. Yeah, I guess that character, there are a couple characters who speak in this sort of overall way. Uh -huh. <laughs> that character is one of them. Sure. Who just sent that email. And then yeah. Yeah, but there's such a difference between, yeah. like, characters that do yeah. that and, like, the overall tone. You know, uh -huh. like, because uh, I love it <laughs> yeah. in some respects. Like, I, I, I really do love that sort of overwroughtness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, um, um, it, as long as you can see it from the perspective of, uh, it's deliberately baroque, right? In some sense, it's a choice. It's not like it's not people kind of because I think if everything's baroque, it kind of implicitly says, well, that's how you do writing. Right. It's yes. by being like Shakespearean, or <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and uh, uh, and I think yeah, if you if you have that contrast of like more plain talk versus you know the the more baroque, it's kind mm -hmm. of a beautiful weird m mess of a okay, mix right, that, yeah. yeah yeah cool yeah so so yeah obviously the the title Kentucky in it and and generally the the vibe and as you say a lot of the influences got a southern kind of yeah. uh, tilt and and I mean I guess on some level um, where uh, where do you get off writing about <laughs> the south uh, or I mean I, I don't really feel like that but I, I feel like there's there's a whole discussion around uh, uh, appropriation or sure, sure. that kind of thing as someone who's appropriated uh, for instance Chicago I was <laughs> right. telling you yesterday yeah. about graphic novel I've set in Chicago I think the reason that felt okay for me was it's going from a position of of, of a Canadian writing about a more powerful place in some mm, respects whereas in someone who isn't from the south writing from the south right. there's that the power dynamic is flipped sure um, so yeah I, I, I'd be interested to know what your kind of trajectory with mm. with uh, thinking about that and your decision. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there are like, I, mean, I guess I have some personal connections to it that are that are kind of important to me. I'm trying to write it through those 
connections, you know. Um, so like, um, you know, I have family there now with mm-hmm. um, Cassandra and her family there, mm-hmm. um, and so, so you know, that's part of it. I think like spending spending time there in that way, mm-hmm. um, and then also this, you know, there's this thing about Colossal Cave Adventure being set in Kentucky, and mm-hmm. <laughs> this really strong personal connection to that game, mm-hmm. and. Um, <clears throat> in a lot of different ways like it's you know it's something it's like one of the first things I remember doing is like playing that game and it's sort of kind of fundamental for me in that way hmm. but then also just this the story kind of what I know of that game is really um, compelling in a lot of ways like the fact that it, it was um, designed by Will Crowther as like a, a thing that he could do with his daughters they could play this game together you know yeah yeah that's really touching to me and then, huh. um, uh, that it's a sort of like um, simulated memory of a place that they visited together. They used to go to this cave, now the cave, and so it's a recreation of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that, and then also the fact that it's this always collaborative project. Like he made a version of it, and then Don Woods um, modified it, and other people modified it, and so it's this kind of like open culture, free culture sort of like thing. And uh-huh. so I don't know. I feel you know really attached to that game, and um, and it just happens to be set in this region where like. But you know, Cassandra's family is from and stuff mm-hmm, too. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, there's that. Um, the yeah, the the southernness thing. I you know, I, I um, like I've talked about like a lot of the stuff that I'm that I'm reading um, and thinking about the writing and, and the characters and stuff are you know are these like southern gothic things and I'm um, and like Flannery O'Connor in particular, she as an essayist like wrote a lot about this this the way that northerners at that time were like you know, the way she felt treated by sort of northern literary folks and stuff. And uh-huh. the, she felt the way she felt Faulkner was being sort of um, treated in position by it. Um, so anyway, um, um, yeah, definitely kind of like trying to do it uh, carefully. Mm-hmm. Trying to mm-hmm. suck carefully. Yeah. And have you, have, have you had responses, negative or positive? Yeah, or definitely. Um, definitely had negative responses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and... Uh, not to like anything specific necessarily. Well, a couple specific things, like some of the characters' names, which, like, I, you know, there's this character named Ezra in it who is, is, shows up in Act Two, but he's mm-hmm. in the Kickstarter. So, mm-hmm. and um, and you know, so there's this real little boy named Ezra who I know who lives in Kentucky. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, but then there's also this like um, distillery, uh, Ezra Brooks, like they make whiskey, right? Okay. And um, so somebody was saying like. You can't just like pick the name of the distillery and name your characters after. Oh, I like, see. Sort of, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. true that that little boy is named after that distillery. So it's kind of like a sort of <laughs> like a, a yeah. long chain of, uh, of connections. But um, you know, and then I think some some people uh, are you know are sensitive to the way yeah. that they're being represented, and so they're mm-hmm. looking for stuff. And you know, they're like they're like you know, why doesn't the char- main character have shoes? And it's like, well, he does He does actually have shoes, but he's sort of rendered in a way that's maybe sometimes, uh-huh. you, can't, you know what I mean? So, right, right. <laughs> so they're like, kind of, yeah. so, I, and I, I, I get it, why people are, are sensitive to that, definitely. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, um, yeah, it's one of those things that you, that um, is, 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 isn't explicitly uh, outlawed uh, in terms of appropriation, and that yeah. kind of thing, but, yeah. I, yeah, that that always makes me kind of like when I think about the power dynamic between like the the, the writer and who's who's defining it and that uh-huh. kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I, but I you know when I was writing about Detroit, I had a lot of uh, anxieties and concerns mm-hmm. about it because I felt as opposed to writing about Chicago, Detroit has is in such dire straits in so so many ways, and so many people are so passionate in its defense. Uh, understandably, and that's one of the th- reasons that drew me to it. But, but yeah, I, I um, uh, yeah, it's really, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, but if you're if you're sort of relegated to only writing specifically about things that have happened to you, sure, then yeah. then yeah, it gets a little, uh, it gets a little monotonous and limiting. And you know, mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel I feel like there's ways to do it that are that are. Um, um, as long as you're willing to engage with the uh, valid concerns of people mm-hmm. who have a greater investment yeah, in some sure. ways, um, mm-hmm. then then I think, I don't know, uh, so, so, 
it works. I mean, to me, it's not something that um, ever. I mean, it's it, in a lot of ways is is a kind of dreamland construct of a variety of things and mm-hmm. times and places. So, um, it's not purporting to be a document, sure. uh, a documentary. Right. Right. Yeah. So I just love the I love the gradual kind of mm. um, zoom in on this on this how it just sort of emerges from the yeah. from the shadows. It's beautiful. Mm. Like and, and, and the and like how what a weirdly modern kind of shape this yeah this car is versus like <laughs> I don't know this thing over here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Water pump on uh-huh. it. Yeah. And then over here you have like super abstract trees. Right. It's yeah. I don't know. It should not work. It really should not work, but it does. Yeah. Like there's an assuredness about the art style that yeah. that's really uh, it, it makes you kind of draws you in and makes you forgive all these as you, as I've sort of pointed out these things that should not work together. <laughs> You want to believe it, you know. It yeah. pushes you that extra. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's like too much information, person here. All the right all at once. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> love that character. Yeah, she started, I mean, she's like sort of a, an experiment in <laughs> these dialogue things. I'm just like, I'm just like constantly trying to find ways to do this multiple choice dialogue in a way that can continue to be interesting without turning into like a RPG dialogue hub and spoke, pumping someone for information kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's hard to, because I want the conversations to all flow pretty linearly, mm-hmm. but it's hard to... Um, from point A to point B while still giving the player like interesting choices all along the way so with her the experiment was um, you know she's sort of her, she's like totally scatterbrained she's like all over the place and so she every time she talks to you she gives you like four or five different things to respond to <laughs> and so you, you basically are just choosing which thing to respond to uh, yeah that's <laughs> neat yeah so it's kind of experiment so you were mentioning that one of the first your first sort of memories was was playing Colossal Caves yeah so, um, like, what? How, how did how did you come into contact with it? Um, yeah, my dad was a student at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, we had a terminal like, in our house, like a, that would dial up to the okay university servers. So I played like I played that a lot, and I played Hunt the Wampus. Okay, that? that was a pretty also in a cave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also was sneaking around the dark. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, Colossal Cave was like this. Was, so at that time, it was the version that Don Woods edited and added monsters and spells and stuff to. Okay. The original, like, that was just like just exploring the cave. It was just a spelunking sim- simulator. There was no magic in it. Um, and then I think Don Woods. The story I think is that he guessed Will Crother's email address because there were th- so few possibilities at that time. <laughs> I've got an email and got the source code. <laughs> rewrote it with added because he was a big um, Dungeons and Dragons guy. So, how, like, how old would you have been when oh, you yeah, were playing uh, it? Four, five, 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 six. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. Like I was, I was mentioning before, um, uh, that like as like I'm a decade older, and I grew mm-hmm. up with um, the Infocom games. At the, yeah. Probably the same time yeah. when I was 14 or whatnot. Right. Um, and it's interesting to me to, to, to see people that are, um, you know, younger still have a kind of affinity for it. But that makes sense if you, if you, if you actually grew up playing those games and like, um, yeah, I guess like, um, uh, did you have like, you haven't been playing them since then. You've been kind of, there's like, what, what have your kind of ebb and flow with like interactive fiction? What's that been like? Yeah. Um. Yeah, kind of. I guess I kind of stopped following it. I mean, when I was also when I was learning to program, I 
you know, I started in basic and was making text adventures, but really shitty text adventures because uh-huh. I was having to do all the parser stuff myself. So right, was terrible. Right. There's like one right answer on every, <laughs> you know, but um, but yeah, I kind of lost track of it for a while, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then and then I think um, in the early 2000s, I I found, or actually maybe even later, like mid 2000s, found um, Photopia by Adam Cadre. Yeah, I started as a paying attention again. Yeah, touchstone for a lot of yeah. a lot of folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, taking it out of the traditional kind yeah. of, um, both the traditional kind of uh, high fantasy and yeah. and the puzzle kind of that's right, focus that's true sort too. of thing, yeah. right? Yeah, there's that one really great like non puzzle in it when you're in the maze, and you can't you can't get out of the maze. But you, he starts dropping hints to you that you have wings. You don't know that you have wings at first. Okay. And then you just fly out of yeah. the maze, and it's just like such a great turnaround of like. Yeah. yeah. Playing with that convention. Yeah. That's like oh, I gotta get my pen and paper yeah, exactly, out. Exactly. What's gonna happen? <laughs> okay. Can I go north. No, south. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I also yeah, I mean with IF stuff. I mean I'm. Yeah, I was telling you. I think I I have a the basic sort of lack of literacy and in interactive fiction that's kind of like a stopping me a lot of the time but hmm. but yeah now I think I'm hoping playing around with it more because mm-hmm. it, it really does require it seems like maybe it's not so bad anymore you were, you were talking about how much progress there's been and like mm-hmm. the parser stuff so it's not sure. there's not as many blockades as there used to be but it, it does require a certain kind of literacy like I know I know it's like you use the letter X instead of typing out examine. I know some stuff like that. You know? Right, right. Some short, short <laughs> yeah, forms. Some, yeah. 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 I kind of, um, I, I, I do those by accident. Like mm-hmm. if I was thinking consciously, if I'm sort of displaying it to people who yeah. are, I would just use examine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, it's just, it's muscle memory, you know, yeah, yeah. it's like X thing. Yeah. You know? It's, it's all, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. It's like the, um, yeah, and I, like I, even that sort of focus with like, uh, um, like away from puzzles and challenges and like looking at, uh, and like looking at kind of like what, if it if it isn't a challenge, what what is it, right? Mm-hmm. Like what what is it, um, what's what's kind of drawing the player along? I suppose mm-hmm. is is like I know with. Um, <laughs> and so this is another kind of small change from the version I played originally. Yeah. Where those guys, I love how it sort of echoes off. Yeah. When you. <laughs> When it goes black, that's fantastic. Um, so uh, yeah, originally it was, it, it was in the K in the in the K in the or mine. like the mine, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so was that because it, the original or the version that uh, that I played originally was it ended there? So was that the yeah yeah? Um, it's uh, I don't know. Yeah, so it did it, it cut off there and. But we still kind of thought about keeping that in there, so they kind of show up, and there's this musical interlude in the middle of that act, and you have you can't skip it; you have to listen to it. And, and, um, but then we ended up cutting that shot mm-hmm. <laughs> completely, so we had to find somewhere to put it. So we tried a few different things, but um, I think that one came out really well. That and um, yeah, I don't know. That was another one of these things that Tomas did, and like I. Just discovered, you know, right, sort of, right, yeah. And so it's uh, I really like that moment. Um, we talked about this kind of in a really rough way about where to put them, but yeah. Yeah, and love this, love this uh, little wheel. <laughs> So yeah, maybe talk a little bit about um, like your relationship to puzzles and some of oh. the reactions uh, in the in the greater games world that you yeah. know, sort of encountered. Yeah. Um, well, 
I'm definitely, yeah, I mean, definitely in this in this game and really in most of the games that I've done, the first few games that I've worked on were, were like, skill-oriented in some way or another. Um, and I just, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's there are a lot of other kinds of things to deal with in games, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and interactivity, and, you know, other than challenges of skill. And I'm also, like, super grossed out by a lot of the... A lot of the culture around the sort of bravado skill stuff, you know, yeah, like yeah. machismo skill stuff. So I beat it. Yeah, I totally. I beat Kentucky Route Zero in like five minutes. <laughs> speed yeah. run. Right, speed run. Yeah. yeah. Although some of that stuff is really cool. <laughs> some of the speed runs are really awesome, but um, like the tool assisted speed runs are super interesting to me. The where they use this tools to let you like pause the game and make like micro movements so that. It's really like machinima plus speedrun. It's really fascinating. But um, anyway, um, yeah, I'm I, I'm also sort of like a little bit suspicious or apprehensive about like what what we're really telling players when we give them all these opportunities to like prove their skill or something. Like mm -hmm. what kind of fantasies we're asserting, or mm -hmm. you know what I mean, or re what kind of like narratives we're um, sort of reinforcing about about media, about power, about mm -hmm. stuff like that, you know what I mean? So those are, yeah, those are my like apprehensions about it. But um, I think sometimes I, sometimes I come off or I get spun into coming off as being like really polemic about right. this thing, which is right. not, definitely not the case. <laughs> like, right, right. Really like just trying to keep an open mind. And sometimes I do have to like, because sometimes we get challenged, you know, like, uh, about you know whether this constitutes a video game or whether there's room for a game like this or you know you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, so so sometimes you know we have to be a, a little bit forceful about. Well, I mean, in in when you get challenged like that, it's yeah. good to have a rationale. Yeah. Sure. That that like you're you're like yeah. you know the reason you're doing it not just to be kind of like. Um, not just to be sort of critical of like a gamer culture. In general, you know, it's not like like puzzles and challenges is such a is such a big part of like yeah. certainly aim, like early and you know mainstream kind of gamer culture. So yeah. you know, if you're pushing back against that to some extent, um, yeah. people will want to know why. Yeah, you know, and and it's good it's good to have a reason because then yeah. it's that's something new that people might have no, not have thought of. Or, yeah, you know. Yeah. I've been reading um, this book, uh, Game Feel. Steve yeah, Steve, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's been giving me, I think, a greater appreciation for some of these like traditional game design concerns that I had sort of like put to the side. You know, hmm. um, and he does it in, in he uh, he draws on like phenomenology um, as a way of thinking about you know playing games as like playing games about sort of embodied experience or something. Game feels all about um, kinetics and uh, uh, haptics and stuff. You know? Right, So right. he's talking, you know, it's like this is about how virtual embodiment works in a game. And, and so these these um, sort of challenges of skill and stuff, that Steve Swink says there, um, that that's sort of how, like challenge is kind of part of how perception works anyway, you know? Yeah, yeah. Learning, it's all about learning and training and stuff. And so he yeah. says these kind of skill-based games are really get you sort of very much embodied in the game and it's this interesting quality to the video game playing experience and stuff. So that's kind of been really com a compelling way of looking at it to me. Really yeah, well. like the challenges aren't the point, but they're they're a method of engagement. Yeah. Like, and, and like of, uh, of deepening the kind of relationship, kinetic or otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and like I you know in um like in everybody dies there's like there are these puzzles in it, um, but they are about they're not a, they're not like about being clever they're about like how the world works and how mm -hmm. the scenario works and how the characters function you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's like seems like it's it, it the challenge of them kind of works in that way you know you have it's like you have to engage with them in this way that you have to try to understand them, you know, because they're mm -hmm. not, it's not obvious, like what, immediately obvious what to do, you know. So yeah, you to, yeah. Of, so that's, that definitely works to its 
favor in that case, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so now I forget um, what direction the, um, the I think <laughs> it's an artificial limb. Yeah, 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 it's just to the south. There. South of yeah. uh, south on sixty five. Yeah, south. Of and then now you want to take a bear head east right here, up to eighty eight there. It's pretty low. Yeah. On eighty eight. Yep. All right. 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 Yeah, there, I was watching a Let's Play of this, which I, I try not to do to watch too many of those, but because <laughs> they're kind of difficult to watch a lot of the time. But I was watching this one, and this guy uh, who's playing it is from Kentucky. And um, he, when he left the gas station he said, and saw the map, he said, "Oh well, man, I wish this was like the real map of Kentucky. I would know exactly where to go because he was trying to go to this one road." And then he started driving, and he was like, "Oh shit!" And he just kind of drove up to <laughs> where he needed to be because okay. it's just, literally just a traced. Map of traced Kentucky? the highway map, yeah. Oh, so, that's cool. So that was really gratifying. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. He was able to navigate it. <laughs> yeah, that's strange, yeah. yeah. Love this conversation. It's like uh, yeah, just the me like the meandering is so gorgeous. <laughs> you can't, you know, you can't run. You can't right. double click to run or whatever. Yeah, kind of like. Uh, <laughs> so um did you have much to do with sound design or yeah mm -hmm. um yeah i did the sound design in uh, in this act and then um uh, ben babbitt the composer we work with did like the music mm. um and uh, he's getting now. He's getting more into doing the sound design too, which is great. He's mm -hmm. really he's really good. Um, and how how do you guys connect? Um, we went to school together. Okay. Yeah. And was he involved with games prior to that, or no? Mm -hmm. Ben, yeah, he's he's a music guy. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't think he really has a gaming. Playing background, game playing mm -hmm. background, or uh, yeah, um, but it's been yeah really cool working with him. I mean, he does have like you know part of like where Tomas and I are coming from is like installation art and media art and software and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. you know so we definitely have that in common with Ben, who also went to art school and stuff like work like that and stuff. So mm -hmm. and you know some, a lot of this is really like so similar <laughs> the pra practices in building a video game are so similar to the process of building like a, an interactive installation or a performance software or something like that there's so much overlap okay in the technology i think i think that would be surprising for people hmm. um yeah well maybe that's uh you know maybe that's part of why some I, sometimes i feel like this this game and the other games that i work on are not like super like designerly or something hmm. do you know what i mean maybe mm -hmm. that's why a, like as a, as a game designer yeah yes yeah. i see yeah yeah yeah, yeah so maybe that's how those practices differ yeah well I feel like the the kind of celebration of your game has a lot to do with and I mean I feel I felt that way about unmanned as well mm -hmm. when the grand jury thing at indicate it was uh, was shocking to me but in retrospect I feel like 
it's let, got less to do with the game specifically and more to do with what the community mm. sort of wants to see oh, more of. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. So mm-hmm. I think that's the thing. Like, you know, there's a very, you know, probably c- contentious kind of tendency. Um, I'm sure people who have grown up living, breathing, thinking games their whole life mm-hmm. and n- are not coming from oblique angles that bringing in new sort of like perspectives are a little frustrated at that kind of, mm. you know, um, that kind of, um, I don't know, when, when things, uh, you know, when, when things that are, that are, um, yeah, like, like me or you as people who are sort of not from that kind of consistent game, um, world in, 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 in terms of like, you know, we've, we've gone to different sort of, uh, mediums and Mm -hmm. worked with different sort of, um, communities and practices and stuff like that. It's, it's, uh, I'm sure it can be kind of irritating if, if you've spent your whole life striving, yeah. but there is a there is a there's a real um, there's a real sort of echo chamber that that results from any community that doesn't look outside itself for mm-hmm. inspiration. So, in the end, I feel like it's a positive thing for the community, yeah. but I'm sure moment to moment for some people, it becomes you know, frustrating and un- seems unfair, huh. you know, mm-hmm. like, cause I, I could imagine, for instance, you were talking about, uh, you know, people being irritated by the lack of challenge or puzzles yeah, yeah. or s- the certain kind of player agency is different and yeah. not, you know, something that they, that they expect, um, or gamers expect. I feel like that is, probably exploded more after you got like the IGF oh. nomination <laughs> right, and right, stuff. Right. Like, so yeah, maybe probably. you want to talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah. I, well, I think, I mean, a lot of the, the reactions that were, that are the most content, contentious, I guess, um, really have come after we released the game on steam and mm. <laughs> reached an audience at that scale, even the IGF stuff, you know, like people who follow the IGF closely, are already a self-selected group, of, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this game was, like, not the weirdest game in the IGF, like, not even close. You know? Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, but on Steam, people have a um, different, very different uh, relationship to video games. Not everybody, but it's such a huge market that there's all kinds of, all kinds of shit going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Is this like, um, would you say of, of of the stuff you've done? Is this the thing that's gotten the most attention and yeah, really positive? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is weird. <laughs> Just facing off. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, right to a scale that I don't really know how to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm glad. I mean, this is the. This is the best thing that I've worked on by far, you know. I think especially because it's this collaboration with Tomas. Is you know, um, like I before I started making video games, like almost everything I did was collaborative. Like I was saying, Tomas and I, in our background, um, working in media art and working in music. You know, you're like in bands. That's like the kind of default unit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is collaborative. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And um, and then I started making games, and I was just doing it by myself for a while. But it's really been, um, yeah, super important to go back to this collaborative mode. I think I, I don't think I'll make games alone anymore. Mm-hmm. It's kind of better, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It feels like kind of coming home to a practice that I'm much happier with. Okay. Yeah. So when you, um, I mean, do you think it helped in terms of, like, making games individually to get a sense of, like, your limitations and just a kind of familiarity yeah. with the yeah I mean it was I, I, I loved doing it yeah is um, there do, do you do you have a feeling that you could have started with something like this or like if you if you started out collaborating from the beginning 
Yeah, you know, it's, well, so, t yeah, Tomas and I tried to start collaborating on a game. We had another game that we mm -hmm. tried to start working on, and we couldn't, like, um, couldn't, like, quite get it to get it rolling. Yeah, yeah. And um, and then I, you know, it, I think, I, like, maybe a six months to a year or something after we sort of abandoned that project was when I started making games on my own. Yeah. Um, so maybe, I don't know, I don't know why that was. Um I, I've had the exact same yeah, yeah. kind of uh, trajectory with a collaborator mm -hmm. um, who m I might be collaborating again with mm -hmm. in in the future, yeah. you know. Um, but there was, yeah, there was a period of time where we were really, you know, we collaborated and but also had a had a coder in the in the mix mm -hmm. and. We had two different coders, and they both kind of flaked out. Mm -hmm. uh, over this is over two years or something. Yeah. You know, we're trying to do a very, very small, simple game, mm -hmm. and uh, and in both cases, it was uh, it's pretty frustrating. And it was um, now I'm at a point where because of my community organizing and whatnot with the Hand Eye Society, there's there's um, there's a lot of I have a lot more kind of depth of of of. Uh, network in terms of you know the different skill sets and programmers are one of them so mm -hmm. um makes it more makes it comparatively easy but back then it, it felt like we were banging our head against the wall like that was like maybe 2002 and three i was yeah. you know it's like 10 years ago i guess at that stage mm -hmm. so yeah maybe um i'm, I'm curious to, see, to hear about your kind of uh community organizing and, and oh, okay yeah um, um yeah, well, uh, lately, I mean, uh, with regards to video games, um, it's just been with the Indie City Games Group, which um, um, Scott Roberts and Aaron Robinson uh, set up, mm -hmm. started, uh, and Jen Frank was involved in it pretty early too. But um, and so I, I just kind of like hooked up with them to help them with their website, basically, uh, and you know, haven't been super active in organizing with it, but. Uh, but I, the one part that I was pretty active in was getting this arcade machine together. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. I guess that, yeah, the arcade machine, our, our kind of version of the idea of like the local indie arcade machine um, is that it would be uh, this thing that would travel around between different venues and like connect real specifically to the venue. We would have games made by local developers that were tuned for this venue specifically. Sort of site specific, yeah, yeah. site specific games, yeah, and that and that that was because we came up with that idea because um, what we wanted was like Chicago was like really well known for all this DIY culture, it's mm -hmm. like you know, music or writing or films or um, craft beer or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and so we wanted to like uh, um, make it also you know like have DIY video games be part of that conversation here, not like in terms of other people looking at Chicago, but just within Chicago, where people think, I'm a Chicago comic artist, or, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, these are my peers, they make video games, and they, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, sort of strengthening interconnections with the DIY communities. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so, and, so putting it in different venues is a way to try to, like, meet different people on their own turf, and get them to play the games that way, and, and mm -hmm. you know, um, also the making new games for each venue is also kind of about these the games on this arcade machine, they're not there because, like, um, we've, like, curated them, necessarily, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just, like, they're there because they were made, you know, for this event, and it's, right. you know, kind of about that DIY kind of thing, it's about, like, so Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> we're being overwhelmed. <laughs> DIY yeah. avalanche. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, I found the same thing in Toronto. There was coming from a zine way back, sort of zine crowd. Um, there's so many similar impulses, but um, in the the indie game community, um, but uh, they don't know each other, and mm -hmm. they don't know they you know so many people that when we had a games room at the at the at the zine fair that weren't even aware that people were making games in the city. 
yeah. didn't they hadn't thought of it as a medium that they could express themselves in right that that an individual could express themselves in right that. yeah yeah character Shannon was such a relief to write because uh -huh. she's just like a straight talker <laughs> you know <laughs> so it's yeah some of the other characters I had ideas about how to embed their personality and the way they you know and so it's all just like harder <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but she's just supposed to be like working class and very direct and, mm -hmm. I love this little bird cage here. <laughs> Whatever it is. Yeah, I like the, the sound of this thing as a kind of uh, turntable or, or mm. like <laughs> that aspect of like a, uh, an old record or something. <laughs> oh, because it sort of speeds up and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. Stuff, right, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll pretend that's all planned. <laughs> yeah. This was one of those really fun sound design things because uh -huh. like it's like a refrigerator and a power drill and like some sounds of like metal dra getting dragged across other pieces of metal and just like all you know and, and these were these things that you found files on the internet yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. like some of those royalty free yeah. creative commons uh, yeah so cool <laughs> really fun to play with and you know I've been doing much music like this so Sorry? I haven't been doing much music like that. Okay. So for the last few years, and so it's also been a fun season to work with these tools. It's quite loud down here now. Right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> down here in the mines. <laughs>
I don't think I discovered that oh. in my original playthrough. He hmm. yeah, has a few optional branches in this. Yeah. Like to. Yeah, stuff that's parallel, you know? Or like this totally optional. Right, stuff. right, yeah. yes. And and um, maybe this is a good spot to, uh, to end it. Yeah, sure. Um, it's near the end, but I don't uh -huh. have to beat it. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah we've got a uh, lots of interesting perspective on how uh, yeah you guys put this thing together and cool. as I as I said I think it's a fantastic piece of work. Oh, thanks. congratulations! <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> so that's it. Okay, how do I uh, stop? Oh, this thing? F9. F9. Yeah.